Hello and welcome to this episode of Media's New Deal, presented by Oxford Road. Media's New Deal is a limited run series focused on helping you adapt your business to the perpetually shape-shifting media landscape in the age of coronavirus. We know that people are suffering and there are real heroes risking their health and their lives to protect all of us. And to those heroes, we humbly offer our thanks and eternal gratitude for your sacrifice. As for the rest of us, we have another war to win and it's economic. The better we perform, the faster we can recover. All of us, we know businesses are struggling, but we are optimistic that we can evolve our strategies and offerings and our teams. This is not a space for fear and anxiety. This is a place for bold leaders to engage in serious conversations about how we're going to fight through this and come out stronger than we were before. I'm your host, Dan Granger, founder and CEO of Oxford Road. Join me for the next few months as I speak with top media executives and industry leaders, giving you a behind the scenes briefing on what's really going on from the people who are leading the charge. You'll get up-to-date insights on where things are headed and practical advice on how you can win no matter the circumstances. This program is produced by the editorial team behind Oxford Road's weekly publication, The Influencer. Special thanks to Bianca, Kyle, and Jennifer for making this happen. Welcome to Media's New Deal. We launched The Influencer a few years ago, and it's grown tremendously as we provide curated news and offer some strategic thought leadership for performance marketers. To that end, we could think of no better guest than the one and only Hernan Lopez. Hernan is founder and CEO of Wondery, the largest independent podcast publisher. Wondery became the fastest network to join the top 10 ranker by PodTrack, propelled by immersive hits like Dr. Death, Dirty John, American History Tellers, and Business Wars. These guys are just a hit machine, and uh, many, many more. Prior to founding Wondery, Hernan was president and CEO of Fox International, a $3 billion division of Fox, until they were eaten by the mouse. And most importantly, Hernan is one of my favorite people in the industry. Uh, my agency's been doing business with Hernan and the team at Wondery for years now, and he's a guy that means what he says, says what he means, and somebody that I consider a friend. So welcome to the show, Hernan. Thank you, Dan. It's an honor to be uh, one of your first guests, and thank you very much for having me. The, the pleasure's all mine. So, um, so I like your picture. Um, how's, uh, how, how's the real bunker doing? Where, wh where are we broadcasting from? I'm doing this from my home office slash former garage, but I think the picture that we have in the background is a little more telling of what we stand for at Wondery. We took it at the Susan J. Komen Cancer Walk uh, in March. I don't know if you guys uh, listened to Dying for Sex, a show that we launched in February about um, two friends, Molly and, and uh, Nikki, one of them was uh, suffering from breast cancer. So we, uh, we did the cancer walk um, essentially to show support for Molly. And uh, it was uh, a really happy moment with uh, about 30 of our employees and our families uh, all attending as well as the host, Nikki. That's wonderful. Are you got, you, you want to throw a call to action on that one? Yes, absolutely. I'm going to do the go same thing at the end, so go ahead. <laughs> definitely go and listen to Dying for Sex if you haven't already. If you think that you know what the show is about, uh, keep listening because it's a really funny show and then into the fourth episode it takes a turn that you don't see coming and it becomes one of the most incredibly emotionally touching stories you ever listen to whether you're a man or a woman uh, some of the reviews that we got on that show were uh, incredibly touching and we're still getting reviews today wonderful uh, if you're running a business right now um, you need visibility and you need control. I mean, can you imagine running your company right now if you didn't have a clear picture of your financials? And look, we're all dealing with enough uncertainty in the marketplace. NetSuite reduces it by giving you visibility and control. With so many critical decisions to make, you need the right numbers and you need them right now. NetSuite by Oracle is the world's number one cloud business system. With NetSuite, they give you financials, cash flow, payroll, inventory, and more all in one place so you have clear visibility and total control of your business. NetSuite customers have the flexibility to work from anywhere with immediate clarity on critical information right at your fingertips. No more guessing, no more waiting. 
Make smarter decisions with confidence because you've got crystal clear visibility into your numbers. Join over 20,000 companies who trust NetSuite to stay in control, including my company, Wondery. Receive your free guide, Managing Business Uncertainty, and schedule your free product tour right now at netsuite.com slash control. Don't wait. Get your free guide and schedule your free product tour at netsuite.com slash control. That's netsuite.com slash control. And very truly, I mean, what a what a timely ad because uh, Hernan and I both happen to be NetSuite customers. And uh, it is a world of difference when you actually know where your numbers stand in real time. And, you know, running a business, you have people's livelihoods on the line. You have people's families on the line, depending on those numbers. And if they're not accurate, it can cost you everything. So very, very important. A hundred percent. We're really happy with it. We've been using it for the better part of one year now, and it's really made an impact in our business. And uh, apropos of what you just said, I know we're going to dive into the impact of COVID-19. We are a small business. We're 62 employees, uh, and in any any business that is very people dependent, having the ability to do the different scenarios and know where the chips are going to end up is hugely important uh, for, for a business at any stage, but especially a business of our size. Okay, now let's down to, uh, get down to the conversation uh, we're here to have, and that is, um, it's about, you know, what we're really trying to do is give guidance to brands that are figuring out how to steer through this marketplace. And so let me just ask you, broadly speaking, how has the sector being podcast been a- impacted, at least in the short term, by the current crisis? I think uh, it's pretty well known that listening uh, has uh, gone down as a result of people commuting less. Commuting was always prime time for podcasts. So where you used to see, I think I saw a blog from Mega from a moment mistaken, that listening patterns had a curve with a peak and then a throw another peak. Now you see a much, um, uh, a much uh, more flat line throughout the day. So people are listening continuously uh, through the day, but as a result, they're listening to a little less. How much less? It depends on each company. For us, uh, we're roughly a little uh, around 15% below where we were right before coronavirus, but we happen to have a peak because we will launch a big show called Dating Game Killer right uh, before then. So uh, we are, we are, we're doing all right. We're doing all right. And uh, I have no doubt that as soon as people start getting on the road, they're going to get back into listening. Um, the other impact that obviously it's not, um, uh, it's no surprise to uh, anyone, being an advertising driven business, I think all podcasts are seeing lower advertising than what they had anticipated. Now, um, it's a luxury to have lower um, uh, advertising compared to an expectation of anywhere between 50 and 80% growth. So if the worst that can happen is that this year we're going to grow less than we thought we were going to, that's not a, actually, that's not a bad outcome in the grand scheme of things. Yeah. And by the way, thank you for saying what you did earlier, because I don't know that I've talked to anyone yet that has flat out come out and said, at least in the podcast space, radio's uh, been a little more clear about it because I think everybody knows it's so closely associated with driving, but in podcasts, Thanks for giving us those numbers. Let me ask you more about that. So you cover a range of different types of programs. And are you seeing some, while you may be down in aggregate 10, 15%, are you seeing that some are down more pronouncedly and others are actually up right now? Uh, Yes, sports obviously is the most effective. We have two sports shows and they're suffering because they one of them is a daily uh, show. The lead it's an amazing show, but people just driving less and they have no sports, so there are less things to cover. Um, and um, on the flip side, news and uh, kids are uh, up in listening. Um, obviously, people are going to uh, news more than they used to, and I think that's true across the entire ecosystem. And the other uh, sectors are the other genres. You really have to look at it uh, show by show. Um, for instance, uh, business is a big uh, genre for us, and it had dropped initially, but at the beginning of April, we took advantage of the great environment to promote shows. We do a promotion campaign, and now 
our main show business force is up at the highest levels uh, since the beginning of the year. Uh, true crime, uh, initially some shows had been an impact, but the single biggest shows that we launched in uh, March were two true crime shows, uh, Dating Game Killer and um, Joe Exotic, the re-release of the um, uh, show about, um, the, you know, obviously that was made famous by the Netflix documentary. And um, so I don't think that you can take uh, trends across each genre. You have to look at show by show. Um, and, um, and, I, and again, we, the, if you look at the impact, there were three weeks in a row from starting with uh, the week of March 13, the listening went down. And then after that, listening went up. And since then, it's slightly been kicking up, ticking up um, to the point that uh, we know that the minute that people start to get on the road, and that's going to happen gradually, we're going to go back to the numbers that we had. So in simple percentages, how much do you think that if news was uh, the biggest beneficiary to start, how much are they up, do you think? It depends on each um, publisher because sure. we have one, our single biggest uh, news show is the Rachel Maddow uh, show. I can't remember the percentage, but they're up, um, you know, they're up significantly and, and it's a daily show. Uh, if you look at NPR and New York Times on the Patrick Ranker, they're up. Um, significantly, and that's um, very related to timely daily content. In the case of um, NPR, they added um, uh, NPR News Now, which is an hourly episode that has right. uh, episode well, of downloads. And so, I know uh, on TV, like uh, on CNN, for example, they're projecting double the typical listenership. So do you think it's as pronounced in podcast as it is on TV, or do you think they're seeing even more significant gains right now? In TV, you're seeing uh, bigger jumps in audience. Uh, that, that, that happens across every time that there's a force um, stay at home. I think Tom Webster, if I'm not mistaken, uh, from Edison Research, uh, was the, the one that compared coronavirus to a really extended stay at home after a storm, after a tornado, after uh, something that forces people to stay in. They tend to watch a lot more and listening, uh, li listen less. Um, but I think when we start to get out people, especially now that we're going into the warmer months, uh, people are starting to uh, go and, and listen again. I can tell you every time I go on a shopping trip to the store, it is to me um, the <laughs> great reunion with podcasting because the second that I get in the car, I start listening to podcasts. Absolutely. Okay, so we know that an aggregate listenership is down a little bit. We know that it's not down much, and in some cases it might even be up other than the uh, usual suspects that are getting hit like sports. But talk to me about inventory and, and the way that might affect pricing right now. Um, you know, as long as I've been in the business, we've seen, you know, every year it gets a little bit more expensive. Mm -hmm. um, what's, what do you think is happening right now in terms of, you know, has, has it suddenly dropped? has inventory, you know, is there now a third more inventory? What does that look like, do you think? And, and you can speak for Wondery, but also, you know, to the extent that you can advise on the industry. Yeah, so I, I don't think there's any, any surprise that some categories just had to pause advertising. Uh, recruiting, for instance, they, they're facing an environment where um, people are not going to be recruiting as much, so, so they had to put the advertising uh, on hold. So yes, there's, uh, there's less, um, demand uh, in the second quarter than there would have been if this hadn't happened. Uh, we're using that actually in a very opportunistic way. We, as you know, we have a collection of shows that are evergreen and uh, that produce episodes here, right? Like Business Wars, Imagine Life, American History Tellers, Ties of History, the new one that we launched, Even the Rich. Um, and we're using all of our free inventory to cross promote our shows, to just to expose people to uh, shows that they haven't listened to before in a way that before we, we didn't honestly have as much available in terms. The other thing that we're doing, in addition to being proactive with clients and making sure that, that clients who stay increase their, their buys, get the best value out of buys, uh, we're doing a, a campaign starting in May to support small businesses because we think that it's important for companies, for everybody, to, just to do something to give back. And uh, a lot of small businesses have been the most impacted by, um, by the economic disruption. So we essentially have uh, 20 businesses that are going to get 
a suite of free ads and, and we go into product created and that's that's starting right now in May, coincided with as it happens with small business month. Well, hopefully you do a better job than the federal government of uh, allocating that inventory and uh, you don't run out uh, the day after you start it. So, um, okay, so, so, so I want to get more specifics out of you on the inventory. So, and look, you don't have to call out your specific network, but if you were to project across the board, how much is revenue down in the second quarter against what was previously projected? Um, I think, I mean, I'm going to quote a number from the IAB mm -hmm. um, that, that just came out, I think, last week. And they, they were looking at um, every sector of the digital ecosystem. And they had digital audio at minus 30% mm -hmm. compared to prior projections. Uh, okay. I don't know whether other companies are seeing more or less. Um, but I, I think that that survey is, is probably a good gauge of what uh, this quarter is relative to what it could have been. Now, that's still up for podcasts. So we, we, we are, you know, we, um, we're in a privileged position, if, if, if you will, um, in that we're still, despite growing less than what we thought we were going to, we're still growing. Gotcha. And do you see a, a remnant marketplace growing out of this in a more robust way than it has in podcasts previously? I don't see it fundamentally changing because remember that podcasts uh, still value host reads, still value the one-on-one -on -one connection between the host and the product. And a lot of podcast advertising is bought um, ahead of time. For us, uh, almost half of our annual revenue uh, was placed uh, already on January 1st. Um, so I don't think that you're going to see a big increase uh, in, uh, in, in other ways of buying uh, podcasts. Uh, one, one, obviously, one of the things that have um, probably affected the digital uh, ecosystem more than um, podcasts have been affected is because a lot of the ads are bought in real time and programmatically. The minute that there is a drop in demand, there's a corresponding drop in uh, pricing. So I think they are seeing uh, from from what I read, uh, from what I read, um, pricing um, pressure, but we're not seeing that in the podcast space. And so it's I know it's hard to prognosticate while everything is in flux and we're all yeah. learn, learning a new dance every day. But you know I think most people have written off Q two as it's going to be what it is, no, and no. then but w what do you see changing for the industry in the back half of this year and then beyond that may not have been the course it was on previously? Um, I think uh, people are going to, I, I mean, every, every time there is um, a, a significant dislocation, there tends to be a flight to quality. So whereas before you had pressure from a lot of brands that wanted to catch up and get into the podcast space and they realized that you know that they just couldn't buy everything because a lot of what they wanted to buy was already bought so they ended up buying sub i mean substitutes i think you're going to see that the stronger products uh benefit and the host reads and organic live reads and uh great content uh, ends up being a beneficiary in in the long run so they um that, that that's on the positive side um and I, I i do hope that the um dislocation doesn't uh affect independence um you know more more than it affects the the big companies and we put us as an independent but we realize that obviously a lot of podcasters are themselves independent they're doing the show every week and every um uh, week you know racing to publish their episode I do uh, hope that the advertisers stick with those individual host-driven shows um, because yeah, they're small businesses and they, um, they depend on advertising uh, more than as much as anybody else. And do you imagine that uh, consumer behavior has changed since we've all been forced to adopt new technologies, new habits? What do you think is going to stick that may actually have an impact on, on the, the world you work in? I definitely, uh, the comfort level with anything remote has gone up significantly. Um, a number of, so people are going to be 
very, I believe, reluctant to take a business trip uh, where um, Zoom call or video conference were doing. So people's level of comfort with video conferences, uh, with buying things online, uh, with streaming. Obviously, there's a massive shift in streaming. Netflix just reported um, about an hour ago record number of new subscribers, 16 million right. subscribers uh, for the quarter. Obviously, you're going to see the same from uh, Disney coming out when they come out with Disney Plus numbers. So add that change um, will be permanent. Um, there's going to be, I'll tell you one thing that I'm, I'm doing less of that I don't see myself doing back. Um, I'm not touching cash. So mm -hmm. I think a lot of payless um, or contactless um, um, services from payment to anything else are, are really going to start to take vogue. Um, and, um, and again, the I think this bodes honestly very well for the direct consumer companies that have been early supporters of podcasting and continue to be uh, supporting the podcast ecosystem. There is um, you know, a number of advertisers that are doing quite well in this environment. Well, it's funny you bring that up because, you know, my agency, we've worked almost entirely with D2C mm -hmm. and the, those are the brands that really built the industry. And right. then I have felt like in the last year or two, there's been such a push for brand advertising to come in that it starts to drive up the price. And it makes it a little bit harder for D2C brands who are you know, notorious for being rigid on performance. Mm -hmm. It's been, um, th they're, now they're competing with advertisers that aren't necessarily looking at it that way. So does this give them a second shot at life and dominance in the podcast ecosystem? And the buys that you're seeing maintain is it more heavily weighted toward D 2 C? I don't think that D 2 C ever lost its prominence in the podcast ecosystem. We, for one, do not. I know that a lot of companies, you know, measure as a KPI the share of revenue coming from DR versus brand. We do not actually. What we do measure is the number of active brands that we have. That's our KPI. So we want to. So in the last. This, the, the fourth quarter, we had 190 active clients. The first quarter, we had 220 active clients. Each of those clients is important to us uh, to the extent that they have a capacity to grow and to the extent that in most of those cases, they are performance-driven advertisers. Um, and, but I, I, I do think that direct-to-consumer companies are, in general, more nimble um, and they are very well positioned to um, to, to increase their spending podcast right now. Well, I mean, and you have to admit, though, you see Geico, you see ADT, you see Rocket Mortgage, and these are not the promo code driven brands that, you, you know, we, we really built the place with. And right. so I, I, do, I do feel like there has been a, a shift. And so I guess my, my question to you is, are you seeing that profile of those that use specific tracking mechanisms that are clearly measuring the response to every ad? Are mm -hmm. you seeing more of that in a post COVID-19 environment than you were before? I think so. Because uh, what we're seeing is that uh, a lot of the branding campaigns um, that we're going to start. So the existing brand advertisers are staying the existing DR advertisers except for those which are in specific categories that are challenged, like travel, are staying. What we saw um, some delay, what we saw um, get pushed to the uh, third quarter are RFPs that were pending from the branding side that were going to happen in the second quarter. Now they're being pushed to the third quarter because obviously brands remember that they have to take more time to get the messaging right. So for a lot of the month of April, we were dealing with companies that were telling us, give us a second, we need to figure out what the right branding, what the, what the right message, what the right tone is. And the benefit of that podcast gave those companies is that they send us copy points on a Monday and the ad is running on a Wednesday. My ad ops team will kill me for admitting this, but <laughs> because in theory it's five days, but, sure. but yeah, that's, I mean, it's, it's very fast. Whereas if, if they had to do, um, a television spot, it's, it's a 30 day delay. Um, so I think, um, you're, again, you're seeing, um, direct brands continuing, uh, to, uh, be in the space and, and, um, traditional brands, um, maybe taking time to adjust their messaging. Well, we'll, we'll take it, uh, if they can uh, take a break mm -hmm. for a little while, right. We can use that inventory. 
So um, are you seeing a difference in, for example, um, the expectations around production quality now that everybody's a little bit more casual? Uh, to some extent, yes, but we are, again, very fortunate that our business has always relied on pr remote production. If you look at a show like Business Wars, the host is in Austin, the writers are all over the country, the sound designers are all over the country, the editors are here in LA. Um, so there hasn't been any disruption or change in quality to that show or any of our ongoing shows. Uh, I think what what, what has been disrupted is, is any new interview-based show that we had in development. It, it, especially at the beginning, all those shows rely on having lined up a number of guests to be ready, and those, those had to be delayed. But we're still launching new shows in the middle of this. We launch Even the Rich, a uh, very fun comedy uh, show and storytelling show with uh, Brooke and Arisha about uh, family dynasties that came out on uh, in mid-March, first uh, season was the Markles and uh, the, the Royal Family, second season the Murnocks. And uh, we, next uh, month, we're launching The Daily Smile, a daily show about good news with uh, Nikki Boy from Dying for Sex. So we are still producing, we're still launching, we're still in the business of getting stories in front of people. It's nice to be in audio at times like this, isn't it? A hundred percent. I talk to people in the television industry, remember the other part of our business, we, we have a significant... Uh, number of uh, our shows 14 right now option for television yeah. and um, one of them uh, was right about to start production in New York sets hired the actors everything ready to go March 16th so that show had to get pushed to um, to uh, to the fall in as far as production but people are still doing what they can writers room are going on um, animation projects are still being finished. Anything that was post-production is being finished, but physical on-set production obviously had to be stopped. So I want to go back to something you said earlier as you were talking about how some of the shows that were suffering when this first happened are now starting to come back a little bit. And, and what I wonder is, are mm -hmm. we getting a bit of uh, news fatigue and are, are we looking for more escapism in the types of content that are going to be coming up in the ratings? Uh, I think if, if you, uh, I'm, I'm a sample size of one. I, I can tell you that's definitely happened to me. At the beginning, I was listening to every um, episode of The Daily, uh, and there was a time at which I said, all right, um, <laughs> enough. I'm going to go back to my general diet of multiple types of shows. Look, in the middle of, those, uh, of all this crisis, of the entire crisis, the single most iconic cultural moment in the U.S. was Tiger King on Netflix. Yeah. Well, there's nothing more escapist um, than that. I thought it had some good practical uh, advice for living in that show. You didn't think that was more uh, instructional? More, more philosophical. Actually, I would encourage people, and, and not that we're plugging our own show, so we, we did obviously Joe Exotic in, uh, in August about the same subject, and then we re-release it now in... Um, uh, now in March. and Oh, yeah, a, you were uh, ahead of that, huh? There was, uh, yeah, nine months. And then we optioned the rights to um, to Universal where Kate McKinnon is going to play Carol Baskin. And I would encourage people to listen to a great interview between Justin Long and Rob Moore that came out on Lucky Show with Justin Long. Um, and, and, and Rob Moore goes into the story about why we're so fascinated by that story and what, what people should take away from it. Um, well, while we're on that subject, is video going to have a bit of a content hangover from all this with all the halts in production? And, and is, it, is it a reasonable, I, like, don't get, not the optimistic answer, but the, you know, do you really think it's possible that consumers will shift time that they could have spent watching something to listening to content? Are those actually transferable because they can't get access to as much new content as they expected? Uh, so the first question, that there's an overhang, definitely. That's being talked about in the Hollywood community already. It is real. Netflix talked about it today in the call. And, and we're not seeing the effects because, obviously, physical production of television is behind actual airing by anywhere between six months and a year. Uh, so we're going to start seeing this overhang play out in the second half of the year. Uh, whether that will translate into more people going into podcasts, I don't know. I think people will continue to their trajectory of becoming podcast listeners uh, at 
the rate at which the discovery rate shows and, and they have friends who tell them about it. Remember, right before coronavirus um, induced lockdown hit, uh, Edison Research put the number of monthly podcast listeners at 104 million. First time that we crossed 104 million and almost nobody's talking about it because of, of all this. So I think that trajectory will take, um, will, will resume as soon as people are out on the streets again. So talk to me about some of the industry practices that this has really tested. So I'll give you an example. When this whole thing hit, we had clients that are like, I have no product to sell. They sold out immediately. A lot of other uh, advertisers were not allowed to sell, even if they had product, right? Mm -hmm. And I felt that media across the board was very understanding in those cases. No matter what the, the, the term said on the deal, they were helping people that definitely needed it. But then there was a, an immediate second wave of brands that I think said, hey, look, there's so much uncertainty. We don't want to say the wrong thing. And we need to conserve cash right now because that could be people's jobs. And I think that if I'm in your shoes, that's where things get a lot harder to decide, are you going to let somebody out of a contract because mm -hmm. it helps, but not because they really need it. Right. And knowing that you're just kind of potentially trading the pain. Um, is that something that's going to have an impact on how stringent contracts are going forward in the podcast space, do you think? Uh, I think it's always going to be a case-by-case -case situation. We always want to be in business with clients for the long run, and we always make those, um, those trade-offs, um, especially at the beginning of the year, sometimes when there's a competitive category and you have one client that will buy uh, a number, a big number of spots against another client who will buy a small number of spots, but you know that the uh, smaller client has been around for longer and it's less likely to take options to cancel in the future. You're going to make those calculations no matter what. And I think it, it's different um, situation where you get a call from somebody in the recruiting industry and they're telling you, look, we're laying off one third of our employees because nobody's hiring. What are you going to do? Uh, different from the situations where people are trying to see how they can wiggle an extra 5% of a buy. So our team is very, so I, I hope you, know, you guys feel this way. A team is very proactive, very solutions oriented, and very fanatically obsessed on customer service and performance. So I, I would think that we're having very constructive conversations with the industry. Yeah, and I think that's been our experience. So um, let's talk about the industry more broadly though. Um, Price Waterhouse Cooper had it pegged at a uh, billion dollars in revenue in 2021 was the last thing I saw. Do you think that's still going to happen? I to that on that number, I do think it will happen. I had been bold and predicted <coughs> that we were going to hit a billion dollars this year. Now I do no longer think that's going to happen, but I still think that the original one billion dollar by 2021 will happen. So I want to take a minute and share a little bit about a, a group called the Koala Corps. And it is an organization that's close to my heart. Um, you know, at, at this moment, there are babies at Children's Hospital and really hospitals everywhere with life-threatening illnesses who are in bed and have nobody to comfort them. And, you know, as we think about one of the horrors of coronavirus, what's been really, really hard is somebody gets um, infected and then you know, you've got people that, that may be dying and whose loved ones cannot come and be there with them to support them and comfort them. It is so horrible and that's happening across the world. Well, that's something that happens every day at a children's hospital because a lot of times there's not enough nurses, parents are sometimes working or can't be in the mix and you get these kids who are in bed um, and really they, you know, they can't walk around, they can't watch TV. And so it's, it's very, very sad and it's very, very tragic. Um, we went through this um, when our daughter, our youngest daughter was in Children's Hospital for about the first six months of her life and had about a dozen surgeries. And we saw this all around us. And while we took great pains to be there virtually all the time, not everybody could. And so one thing that was really important that we vowed to do is to help with this issue and really led by my wife um, she launched the Koala Corps um, so that we could help facilitate getting volunteers to come in and hold children who need that comfort when there can't always be someone to help them out. And the, the, the 
interesting part about it is there are enough volunteers that want to do this. There's plenty of people that want to help. And I know this is the opposite of social distancing, but that's not going to last forever. Um, and, and so you've got this supply of people that want to solve the problem. What you don't have is enough money to actually pay somebody to run the program, to train people, to screen people, to schedule people, to help with the volunteers. And so you, you have this great, great need. You have people that want to help and nobody in the middle. So the purpose of the Koala Corps is to raise enough money, starting with Children's Hospital in Los Angeles, to hire one person for three years. We're about 23% of the way there right now, and we need all the help that we can get. Um, this is a long-term problem that, that the Koala Corps is, is, is hoping to solve. Koala Corps takes no money into the organization. There's no paperwork. All the donations go directly to Children's Hospital but it's a conduit. So I would ask anybody that's, that's watching or listening today to go to koalacore.com. That's spelled K-O-A-L-A-C-O-R-P-S.com. That's koalacore.com. And please give to that. Okay, so Hernan, something you and I have talked a lot about in the past is the smart speaker and how podcast was a big innovation because the walls came down and now everybody could have a show. And there's been a renaissance in in what kinds of content are now available. And you're a great example of, of that. What are your predictions in the smart speaker space and how is that going to impact the audio industry? And, and is there anything you're thinking about in those regards that, um, that people could know about? There's um, actually, we don't know enough. I'd wonder about smart speakers because the account still for a small share of our uh, listening. And the reason for that is our shows were always designed to be evergreen, listened to from beginning to end with a lot of attention. And the smart speaker is not always the ideal environment uh, to listen to a show, a single show for 25 minutes with a lot of attention. Now, uh, we are starting to do shows that are designed to play well on smart speakers, and those shows are daily and they're shorter. Um, obviously, the lead, uh, our sports show is the first one. We, uh, also, we have a shorter version of the lead called the lead in 10, and that's done exclusively for, for the Google smart speaker. And we uh, are, are about to launch, as I mentioned, the daily smile. That's going to be a daily 10-minute um, microcast uh, that will also play well in smart speakers. Uh, so I, I think um, we're going to learn more about how consumers interact with podcast content on smart speakers through the, those shows. What we still haven't been able to figure out is how to replace the notification. Uh, that is a key um, feature of the Apple podcast and other um, ecosystems on smartphones. It, it's great to have a notification pop in your phone every time that there's a new episode of a show you subscribe to. You, you just can't do that as easily on smart speakers. And, and do you think that the speaker lends itself better to um, to shorter content than the ways that, you know, like the iTunes library. Like, I wonder if iTunes is, is more suited to longer form or if short form would fall flat in that environment relatively, but you might be able to speak to that with authority. I, I think Apple podcast works for every kind of environment. So Apple podcast works for a two minute show as well as it does for, um, for, um, the uh, George Carlin three hour lunch, uh, long show. I think it's uh, smart speakers where you see the limitation that if the show is too long, people are not going to listen to it in its entirety and they're not going to remember to come back and pick up where they left off. All right, well, thanks for going into the future with me. Now, now if we can move back into the present for a moment, mm -hmm. I, I wanna talk about creative. And when this whole thing broke, if you were able to keep advertising, you were probably thinking, how do I not screw this up? Anything that I say is going to feel wrong. And so um, what are you seeing in terms of the evolution of how people's messaging is, is flowing in this environment? Uh, I think um, there's been a number of articles about this where the advice has been acknowledge and be empathetic. Don't disappear. Don't hide away from the problem. Make sure that your consumers feel that you are there as something like 70% of consumers expected a brand to speak to them in terms that make them sound empathetic. The problem that has happened is that 
it's very difficult to be at the same time empathetic and original. So we've had this onslaught of so many ads that use the same words. And, uh, and now the articles are about how consumers are starting to tune out of those ads um, because they heard the same pitch from uh, many different kinds of brands uh, before. Uh, so it's difficult. I, I wish I had uh, good advice for, for, um, for brands. Uh, I, I, I honestly, I think there's very, Person between you and, and your consumers, and every brand knows the consumers most. Um, I think Edelman actually was a company that did one of the best um, service about how companies are, are talking to the consumer through the crisis. Well, and I, I think it changes by the day even. You yeah. probably saw the thing that came out this week. Somebody did a mashup of all the different ads. I saw that. And you saw they're all saying the same thing, using the same types of music. It's, uh, yeah. And yeah. we're like, ah, can't get it right. So. Um, so do you think that we are getting close to a scenario where consumers want you to drop the together thing and just get down to business? Do you think that we're moving into that type of environment? I, I, I have seen people taking that stance. I think so. Um, I, At I least think in so. advertising, by the way. I don't mean yeah, 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 how course. we approach the world. I just mean in terms of when, when you're there to do a, a sales job, do they right. want you dancing around it? Yeah, I think so. But, but the, one of the biggest challenges is that people are being impacted in completely different ways throughout the country. So if you lived in New York two weeks ago, you were seeing the horrible you know, images of the trucks and, 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 uh, and, and the bodies. And, and it reflected in a completely different way that if you are in Texas or, or a state where uh, coronavirus hasn't affected many people as, as a health crisis, but it's clearly affecting a lot of people economically. So it's really hard to come up with a message that plays across the country. It's, um, it's, it, it is it's famously hard. Yeah, pick your poison, right? Right. So as, as you see this thing evolving, um, you know we've, uh, we've been pretty divided for a while now in this country, especially in the last few years. Do you feel like this is actually bringing people closer together? Or do you think, feel like it's just deepening the divides? So I think both things are true in, in different respects. I think people are feeling that there's a common enemy and that's the virus. And then we need to go out and do what we can as a country to fight it and to overcome it. And the economic environment, obviously something that the, the misery unites us all. On the flip side, I have read, um, I can't remember where it was, that one of the reasons why there's a um, political divide, um, or, or one of the things that exacerbates the political divide is that it just so happens that the states or the, the places where coronavirus has hit hardest tend to be big cities, and those big cities tend all to be blue. Um, so you're, you're getting up you know, an environment where um, you know, democratic, a lot of democratic voters are seeing uh, coronavirus more directly just because they happen to live in big cities, not because they happen to be uh, voting democratic um, and the reverse is true. So yeah. I, I'm a, look, I mean, at the beginning of the um, crisis, um, I, I, I said to people, every time that you have a massive event that changes your life, you have to think about what's the silver lining. And, and I thought that the silver lining on this one was going to be, or I still think uh, this, that's going to be that we're going to be more appreciative of the little good things that we have in life. I, I, I really do think that that's because, you know, I obviously I grew up in um, um, a Latin American country, so I didn't grow up with the kind of great things that um, are taken for granted here in the US. So I've always been very mindful of the privileges that we have and how um, it's, that they're taken for granted, especially in, you know, Ten years of economic growth and record employment, a lot of those things yeah. just are not as appreciated. And I, th I think that's going to happen after we come out of this. Uh, somebody though asked me, "And do you think that we'll be more united?" Right. And that's a big question mark for me. I don't yeah. know. I would, uh, I would love for that to be true, but I don't know. Yeah. No, I I think that you're right, and I, I do think that this country. There are generations of people that haven't known the real kind of hardship that people do know in other countries and we haven't known here in some time. But I think that people may get a taste of that now. And so I suspect people's gratitude will go up. But 
I do fear for the country that we're going to continue down the polarized track that we're on when this could have been a uniting event. And so, um, so that's something I'm hopeful for uh, as well. Um, so, so on that note, and you know, this is, this is not a venue to, you know, to get into our, our personal political opinions, but more in, in looking at the, the kind of business of news and business of politics, mm -hmm. you know, when, when Trump was elected, there was, you know, we talked about the Trump bump and the news ratings went up. And right. then we talked about the Trump slump because people started getting fatigued with that. Right. Mm -hmm. And then we had this COVID thing happen and everybody's, perpetually shocked again and so everybody's glued to the tv do you feel like this is perpetuating a culture of adrenaline junkies in terms of news consumption where we just need more and more chaos to gain our attention and, and is it all going the way of jerry springer or do you think that it'll start to normalize after this it's hard to tell um the way it's going to be i mean but even if you look at you know, i'm, I'm um, I'm, I'm almost 50, and uh, when I moved to the U.S. 20 years ago, the news environment that we had uh, was different from what we have right now. Um, yeah. And so I think you are going to see that when one style of television drives ratings, the networks are going to continue to lean into that style of television. It's, it's inevitable. Um, but there are many ways in which people get their news podcast being one of them. I, I think there's no, um, the, 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 there shouldn't be any big surprise that the daily is as huge a hit as it is because it gives you great context and news and in an emotional and empathetic way and factual at the same time. That's really hard to do all at once. Um, I personally um, don't watch a lot of uh, news on TV just um, because even obviously when I was in the office, there wasn't the time when I got home, there were other things to do other than watch news. Um, but I always be more of a reader and I, I get my, my diet of news from, from, um, from many publications. Yeah, I always think that that's interesting to know where people actually get their information from, especially people that need to stay in the know for, for their work. So, yeah. so what, what publications do you read? So, what are some of your uh, favorites? It's, um, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, when I list them all, I'm going to sound no, I'm like an obnoxious news junkie, but I'm not. I just, I, I like to get um, enough information from different sources. So Wall Street Journal has been, I've been a subscriber for 20 okay. years, New York Times for a long time. LA Times, I just recently reactivated my subscription because I think that supporting local newspapers okay. is crucial and they have great reporting. Uh, the Economist, I uh, read every week. And as far as summary um, newsletters, uh, I can't recommend the Axios newsletter enough. Yeah. It's yep. amazing. It's the first thing that I read yep. every morning, and it's free, and, and it's, they have great information and content. That's good stuff, yeah. Hey, uh, Hernan, we only have a, a few minutes left, but tell, tell me about Podcast Academy, which I um, mm -hmm. uh, frankly have not been following as closely as I probably should have, but tell, tell me about that. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an initiative that came out of a group of people that are in the industry. It's essentially, the goal is to do for podcasts what the Television Academy and the Oscars have done for TV and, um, and, and film. It's to celebrate excellence, to have a forum where professionals can be members of an organization and can say, I'm a proud member of the Podcast Academy, and they can do network events and they can attend seminars. And every year they get to vote for the best podcast in a number of different categories. And, and that, that award will be neutral, will be peer-based, and will be available to every professional, obviously every professional that joins the organization. And you were a uh, co-founder of this effort, correct? Um, I'm one of the founding members, yeah, along with uh, Kirk Hoffman from PRX and Eric Dean from Stitcher and Courtney Holt from Spotify. And it's 17 of us, actually, the, yeah. the Board of Governors has um, roughly equally number of people that come from uh, you know, companies um, and independents, uh, Donald Albright from um, from Tender for TV, Up and Vanished, um, uh, Barry Sykes from Podcast in Color. And, uh, and the goal was always to do a very big tent, a tent that 
essentially includes um, people who have been doing podcasts for a long time. Rob Greenleaf from Lip Simple, but is also host of the New Media Show, been doing podcasts for over 15 years. And people that are more recent, like myself, I've only been in the industry for five years. So it's funny, one of the only things I remember when, when all the news came out about it was it was like the scandal of the industry for five minutes. And I, and I couldn't figure out, like, are, are we that short on news about po- the podcast industry? What, what was the controversy that... that it was, was a yeah, no, it was a, a, a misunderstanding. What, what happened was that there was another organization called the Academy of Podcasters, and they had a Hall of Fame and um, we talked to them uh, before we uh, decided to launch the Podcast Academy to make sure that they weren't going to have another award that would compete with us. They told us that they wouldn't. Um, but it turned out that they hadn't announced that to the existing Hall of Fame uh, winners. So when we came out with that announcement, the Hall of Fame uh, winners, um, you know, rightly uh, felt left behind. They felt that they had been ignored and, and in reality them when we explained to them that it was just a misunderstanding. They they are happy with it. Actually, one of those winners is now um, Rob Greenlee. is now a governor of, of the board. Um, so um, so yeah, there's no controversy. So the day is saved. Everybody uh, yeah. rides off into the sunset. Very good. Okay, so so finally, uh, Hernan, um, you know, imagine that that the people that are watching or listening to this, they're marketers. Um, they've got the same trepidations um, as everyone you've been talking to have and just really trying to figure out what should my plan be for the future? What, what advice would you give to marketers trying to figure out what to do next in the, in, over the next few months and over the course of the year to prepare for the changes across the landscape? So I would think that in this environment, trust matters. And that's the one thing that podcasts, especially host, um, you know, of, of, uh, host of podcasts, but, but podcasts as, as a whole provide to the listeners. Listeners are going to want to rely on that friendly voice and they're going to want to you know, get, um, just hear from somebody who they trust. And, and there's no better time for brands to be close to um, voices that people trust than in times of crisis. So I do realize that sounds self-serving because that's a lot of yeah, moments. You're, you're in a position to be so. It's fine. And, and I think it, it happens to also be true. So that, 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 Thank you. And, but I, I genuinely believe that. I mean, that, that, yeah. that's why in this environment, uh, that was said at the beginning, when we noticed that there was available inventory, uh, what did we do? Just use it to promote our shows. And it's had yep. a lot of great success. Yeah, we, we all need somebody to trust right now. Uh, Hernan, thank you for spending this time with us. I really appreciate you. For show notes from this interview, information on upcoming guests and additional industry-related news, please visit OxfordRoad.com. Subscribe to The Influencer, our newsletter. And once again, if you like the show, please subscribe, share or save in iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. We have some really incredible guests coming up and we would hate for you to miss out. Thank you for spending a few minutes of your day with us. Let us know your thoughts, send your questions and comments, and above all else, never, never, never give up.